Good morning. Thank you, Jack, for that great introduction. As Jack told you, I'm deaf blind. Public speaking is easy when you can't see the audience. <laughs> and if you have to send that email, I won't see you typing on your phone. I do have a system for audience feedback. Remember, there are always alternative solutions. When we're thoughtful and creative, we can always find an alternative way to do something. My name is Haben Gurma. The name Haben comes from Eritrea, a small African country. To the north is the Red Sea, and to the south is Ethiopia. My mother grew up during the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. There was violence in the streets, fighter jets in the air, and fear spilled into the classroom as well. For the students who grew up during the war, stories were very powerful in combating the fear. Stories influence the futures we design, the organizations we build, and the careers we imagine for ourselves. Stories are incredibly powerful. My mother heard stories like, America is the land of civil rights. America is the land of opportunities. And when she was 16 years old, she took the dangerous journey walking from Eritrea to Sudan. She spent 10 months in Sudan as a refugee and a refugee organization helped her come to the United States. Several years later, older, wiser, my mother realized geography doesn't create justice. People create justice. Communities create justice. All of us face the choice to accept oppression around us or advocate for justice. As the daughter of refugees, a black woman, disabled, stories sometimes say my life doesn't matter. I choose to create my own stories. I choose to create new meanings to things like disability. For me, disability means one or two limitations, but those limitations are just limitations in that particular area. My vision is very limited. My hearing is very limited. But I still have many other talents and skills. And when we're thoughtful and creative, we find alternative solutions. So I can't read with my eyes, but I learned to read with my fingers. Braille. Computers can provide information in multiple formats. So I use digital braille. If a blind person can hear, they can use text-to-speech and listen to audio information on a computer. I travel around using a white cane, or sometimes I also use my guide dog, Maxine. She was trained to guide and move around obstacles. I'm the one in control. I give her directions, forward, left, right. So we work as a team, traveling around. There's always alternative solutions. And being thoughtful and creative, I find these solutions. Disability is never the barrier. The barriers are society and obstacles people create. And it's up to all of us to choose to practice inclusion. Thank you for the applause. <laughs> when I was in college, I asked myself, what can I do to make our world more inclusive? How can I contribute to a better society? I went to college at Lewis and Clark College, a small college in Portland, Oregon. Lewis and Clark loves their pioneers. Their football team, the Pioneers, their college newspaper, the Pioneer Log, 
Their shuttle, the Pioneer Express. The shuttle's destination, Pioneer Square. So for someone who's different and takes new paths and go where most people don't dare to go, I was at the perfect college, a place that celebrates difference. The college cafeteria served as a central place for all these pioneers to hang out and relax between classes. When you enter the cafeteria, along three of the walls are large windows showcasing Portland's rain. Along the fourth wall are food stations, and people would browse a print menu and then go to their station of choice. The menu's in print, so sighted students can browse the print menu, but blind students can browse the print menu. Blindness itself wasn't the problem. The problem was the format of the menu. So I went to the cafeteria manager and I explained, as a blind student, I can't read the menu because of the format of the menu. Can you provide it in alternative formats, like Braille or digital, accessible digital formats? You could probably easily email it to me and I can read it on my computer. He told me they're very busy and I should stop complaining. I don't know about you, but if there's chocolate cake at Station Four and no one tells me, <laughs> I'm not feeling appreciative. Back then, I was a vegetarian. It's really hard to make food choices if you don't have access to the food information. Sometimes I'd wait in line for 20 minutes. Get food, find a table, try the food, and discover an unpleasant surprise. Life was frustrating, but on the other hand, it's just food. At least I have food. Who is I to complain? My mother, when she was my age, was struggling as a refugee in Sudan. Who was I to complain? About not having food choices when there's so many other struggles around the world. For the first few months, I just tolerated the situation. I didn't think I deserved full access. I didn't think it was something I should fight about. And I talked to my friends, and they reminded me, "It's my choice." It's up to all of us to choose whether we want to advocate for greater inclusion. In 1990, Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. Places of public accommodation, like that cafeteria, are required by law to provide access to people with disabilities. I returned to the cafeteria manager and framed the issue as a civil rights issue. I explained that I needed to have access, and if they wouldn't provide access, I would sue. I thought lawyers would like that. After framing the issue as a civil rights issue, everything changed. They started to provide access to the menus. They would email the menu, and I'd have access. And because I have the skills to navigate an environment, I would use my white cane to go to station one, station two, depending on what the menu said. And having access to information made life so much more delicious. The following year, another blind student came to the college. He didn't have to fight for access. He had immediate access to the food information, and he could make informed choices about what he wanted to eat. That experience inspired me to become an advocate for people with disabilities. If I make changes, it affects other people too, and it improves opportunities for lots of different people. I decided 
to pursue a career in law. And in 2010, I was admitted to Harvard Law School. Harvard told me we've never had a deaf blind student before. And I told Harvard, I've never been to Harvard Law School before. <laughs> Without having all the answers, we pioneered our way using assistive technology and high expectations. We have a photo from graduation. Dean Minow is handing me my diploma at Harvard Law School. We're wearing academic regalia, and Maxine, my god dog, is wearing a fancy fur coat. <laughs> As I share slides, I'm going to be providing visual descriptions because it gives blind individuals access to information. So that's one way you can help increase access is when you post images online, social media, on your websites, include image descriptions so that everyone has access to the information. An interesting story about Harvard. Helen Keller was a famous deafblind woman who lived from 1880 to 1968. When she was looking for a college to attend, Harvard wouldn't admit her. Back then, Harvard was only for men. Helen's disability didn't hold her back. Her gender didn't hold her back. It was the community at Harvard that chose exclusion. Helen went to Radcliffe College. The college chose to be inclusive. They provided materials in Braille. She had her interpreter to have access to the audio information. She was brilliant and hardworking and successfully completed college at Radcliffe College. Access is up to communities. Communities create arbitrary barriers. And all of us have the choice to help remove those barriers. We've come a long way since that time. Harvard has since opened its doors to women, people of color, and people with disabilities. All of us can help continue in removing these barriers. I want to share a photo that highlights inclusion. In this photo, President Obama is standing at a table, typing on a QWERTY keyboard, connected via Bluetooth to my digital Braille display. And I'm standing at the table, reading what the president is typing. President Obama normally talks through his voice. And when we explained that I'm deafblind and access information best through touch, like through Braille, he gracefully switched from voicing to typing. This is what access looks like. It's people choosing to be inclusive, people choosing to remove barriers. And when we choose to remove barriers, our community sees that and we become role models for other people. So this photo has represented inclusion for a lot of people. And when they see this and they see President Obama being inclusive, it sends a message to lots of different people to also be inclusive. So when you choose inclusion, you help role model this for other people in your community. Another form of communication is sign language. Deaf communities are innovative. Sign language is a form of innovation. Hundreds of communities all over the world have developed their own sign languages. In America, it's American Sign Language. In France, they have French Sign Language. Across the pond, the Brits have their own language that makes no sense to me. They call it British Sign Language. So deaf individuals not having access to audio information created a visual language. And deaf-blind individuals, also innovative, developed tactile sign language. So an individual who's blind can put their hand over a person's hand and feel the signs. 
and through feeling the signs, they have access to this whole language. In the video, a young man is signing and I'm holding my hands over his hands and feeling his signs. And that's how we're having a conversation. There are lots of different ways to connect with people. When we're thoughtful and creative, we find these solutions. Another form of communication is dance. Dance is similar to sign language in that it's a communication through movement. A lot of people assume that someone with a disability couldn't dance. Deaf individuals who can see can watch musicians, watch their hands, and see the beat. Or they can watch other dancers on the dance floor and see the beat. Individuals who are blind but can hear can listen to the music and move their body in response to the music. And someone who's deafblind can feel the movement through dancers' hands. And that's the system I use. When I dance with someone, I feel their hands, I feel the movement through their hands and their shoulders. And that's how I connect with music and other dancers. Touch is a powerful tool. Skin is our largest organ, yet we often overlook the opportunities of communicating information through touch. The intersection of haptics, the study of communication through touch, and technology has a lot of potential for innovation. And then I'm excited to see what people develop in terms of haptic vibrating watches, and other technologies that take touch to another level. I've given lots of different examples of access, of being creative. And now I have a question. Why bother? Why bother making your services inclusive? Why bother making your law firms inclusive? Lots of different reasons. There are 1.3 billion people with disabilities all over the world. In the United States, we have 57 million Americans with disabilities. So when you make your services accessible, when you encourage your clients to make their products accessible, more people have access to that. And when you have a larger audience, that means more revenue. So better business for everyone. Another reason, and this one's often overlooked, is when you make your services accessible, you increase the discoverability of your content and your services. For example, if you add captions in a transcript to a video, more people are gonna find your video online through powerful keyword searches. The more text associated with your content the more keyword searches are gonna lead people to your content. Same with image descriptions. If you add text descriptions to images you post online, on your website, social media, you facilitate more people finding your content. So it increases content discovery. Another thing to keep in mind is innovation. People with disabilities drive innovation. Throughout our history, many of the technologies that have been developed were inspired by people with disabilities. These are stories you often don't hear about, so I'm gonna share two of the stories. One story is from Italy in 1808. There were two friends, one sighted, one blind. They wanted to share letters. This was back before Braille, back before email. And if a blind person in 1808 wanted to send a letter, they would normally voice their letter to someone else and someone else would write it down. These two friends had to keep their letters private. They were love letters. So they thought, what can they do? They wanted this relationship to continue. How can they can, uh, communicate their love and affection 
when one individual is blind and most of the writing systems required sight, they used that challenge as an opportunity to innovate and they developed the first working typewriter. When you type, you're using touch and it's a way to develop print to write a letter without using your eyes. Incredibly innovative back in 1808. Nowadays, lots of people use keyboards, and some of the fastest typists are touch typists. There are lots of stories like this of people with disabilities innovating, developing new solutions. Disability is an opportunity to take a challenge and develop the next big thing. Vinton Cerf is one of the fathers of the internet. He's deaf, hard of hearing, and communicating over the telephone is challenging when you can't hear very well. And he developed one of the earliest email protocols. When you send messages through text over the internet, you don't have to stream to hear it. So it was a beautiful solution that helps resolve a disability-related challenge. And the whole world benefited. Now everybody uses email. Ariane, have you seen anyone typing emails during my talk? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> All right, I'll pretend I didn't know that. So disability drives innovation. When you hire lawyers with disabilities onto your teams, when you encourage your clients to increase hiring of people with disabilities or design products to also be inclusive to disabilities, more people benefit, more people can access the services, and it helps develop the next big thing. So these are all some great reasons. Innovation, reaching a larger audience, increasing content discovery. If you're still not persuaded, there's also the law. The Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. And there have been several cases recently of the Americans with Disabilities Act being applied to digital services. I actually worked on one of these cases National Federation of the Blind versus Script. Script is an online digital library. And the National Federation of the Blind filed a lawsuit against Script because blind individuals couldn't read books on Script. And blind, blind individuals want to be able to read books just like anyone else. The technology exists to make services accessible. But Script hadn't developed their website to be accessible. And Script argued that the ADA only applies to physical places. It doesn't apply to online services like Script. And I was one of the attorneys arguing on behalf of the National Federation of the Blind, and the judge sided with the National Federation of the Blind and held that online services are subject to the Americans with Disabilities Act, including script. So please teach your clients about the Americans with Disabilities Act and remind them that online services, websites, apps also need to be accessible. I'm going to share a video that demonstrates what an accessible app looks like. A screen reader is a program that converts graphical information to speech or digital braille. The screen reader on the iPhone is called VoiceOver. VoiceOver also works on the Mac, iPad, and the Apple Watch. So when I'm using my phone, I use VoiceOver. VoiceOver can speak out loud and send information to the digital braille display. News. Checking for new news. National Geographic. Unread. 
world's largest rodents on lamb from Toronto Zoo. I'm panning right on the braille display using the advanced forward button. If I wanted to instead use hand gestures on the iPhone, I could flick right with one finger. To open an item, I can double tap anywhere on the screen. Text size, caption, title, with title, world's large title. After escaping from the High Park Zoo in Canada, two capybaras have eluded capture for by Jason Biddle. Published June 9, most people do their best to avoid rodents of unusual size. But after a pair of capybaras escaped from Toronto's High Park Zoo on May 12, alert, Gordon. Hi, I'm at the door sushi, pot of food, fish cake with swirl design. <laughs> My friend's at the door, so I'm just gonna let him know. Close, button, reply, button. Messages notification. Hang. In. There. I'm. Almost. Done. With. This. Demo. Send. Button. VoiceOver has allowed me to access more information, news, mail, and messages. And it's also a way for me to know when friends are at the door. Thanks for watching. Bye. Screen readers are one form of accessibility features. When you have a screen reader, when you design your website or app to be compatible with screen readers, then blind individuals can access your content on your website or app. VoiceOver is the screen reader used on Apple products, on Windows. There are several. One is called JAWS, one is called Window Eyes. A popular one on Android is called TalkBack. There are guidelines online that teach web developers how to make their websites and apps accessible. So it's not a separate app or a separate website for blind people. Separate is never equal. What we want is one mainstream service that everybody can use. And when you design it to be compatible with accessibility features like screen readers, then you, your service reaches more people, which means more business. Another feature is captioning. Captions are texts that appear on screen, and these, the text of the audio information provides access for deaf individuals. It also increases your content discovery. There are also assistive devices like braille displays, switch control. Switch control are devices that help individuals with limited mobility. Maybe someone can't use their hands, can't use a typical mouse or keyboard. They'll use switch control. And when you make your service compatible with switch control, you reach a larger audience. These are some of the accessibility features that currently exist. Keep innovating. Keep thinking of new ways for people to connect and share information. Our goal is to have a world where everybody has access to information. All websites, all apps, all self-driving cars. Everybody should be able to use a self-driving car but it's only going to happen if the designers and the developers and the lawyers advising them talk about accessibility and think about accessibility. Several years ago, I went to China for the first time. After a long flight from the United States to Beijing, I was tired. I went to my hotel, and before taking a nap, I explored my hotel and I discovered something very strange. I picked it up, I moved it around in my hand. I was trying to figure out what it could be. It almost felt like a piece of fruit, but I never felt anything like it before. I wondered, should I taste it? I was very curious to figure out what it was. 
but not so curious that I would put an unknown object in my mouth. So I got out my phone, took a picture, and texted it to a friend. And I asked, what is this? Is it safe to eat? It was dragon fruit. And I discovered I like dragon fruit. Now, there are a lot of people who would think a camera app wouldn't need to be accessible to blind people, because blind people would never take pictures. Our goal is to have everything accessible. Try not to assume what people with disabilities can or can't do. We'll find new ways to use services once they become accessible. Lots of blind people take pictures. We share stories, we share memories, and we use picture taking as a way to figure out what strange things are in strange places. So remind everyone to make services accessible so everyone has opportunities. After this, it'd be great if you could go back to your communities and look around for potential barriers. Try to identify barriers in your community. And once you've identified barriers, work to remove those barriers so that more people have access, so that more people can connect and share information. And it also means greater business for your services. Identify and remove barriers. Guidelines exist for digital barriers. The Web Content Accessibility Guidelines for websites. And for app, there are Android's Accessibility Guidelines and iOS Accessibility Guidelines for apps for Apple. Use these guidelines to help make your services more accessible. Also, remember to educate and teach your communities. Tell more people about the Americans with Disabilities Act and remind them that it applies to digital services. We have a video from a very interesting museum. It's the City Museum in St. Louis. And this video shows me exploring the museum. As I climb a dome, a four-story dome, with all sorts of ladders and strange things going up to the top, I can't see the path going forward. And I can't hear instructions from my friend who's down on the ground filming me and trusting me to be safe. I'm an explorer. The whole world is an unknown when you're deafblind. And if you move forward as a pioneer, if you're thoughtful and creative and find alternative solutions, you'll find a way to get through the path. Don't be afraid of the unknown. Embrace the unknown. Become a pioneer. There are always opportunities for you to explore and learn more. And when you're thoughtful and creative and continue exploring, you'll find new solutions. You'll find opportunities, especially when you increase hiring for lawyers with disabilities and have people who are thoughtful and creative and used to thinking differently. Difference drives innovation. Diverse teams are stronger teams. I hope you'll all join me in being explorers and working to make our communities more inclusive. Thank you. The last slide has my contact information. I'm on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, under Haben Grimma. And you can also contact me if you have additional questions. But first, I want to give you an opportunity to ask questions here. We have a keyboard and a table, so people can come on stage, type their question, I'll voice their question, and provide an excellent answer. 
So does anyone have questions? Come and line up on stage and Lindsay will help direct people to the stage. Great talk. And, and who's typing? What's your name? Oops, Joshua Lennon. Hi, Joshua. Thank you, Joshua. Hi. I'm a fan of the City Museum, too. What's your favorite place to explore there? I've been to the City Museum only once so far, and it was amazing. Everything was new. I had no idea what to expect. And I loved the opportunity to physically explore a place, climb when I have no idea where I'm going. It's, it's really exciting when everything stays new and there's a lot of unknowns. I'm not afraid of the unknown. I'm thrilled to be a pioneer and explore the unknown. And I'm sure one day I'll go back to the city museum if you haven't been to the City Museum, take the time to check it out. Some people say it's better than Disneyland. Thank you. You're welcome, Joshua. Hi, Haben. I'm Doug. Good to meet you, Doug. Good to meet you. Can you talk a bit about the special relationship you have with Maxine? Absolutely. I've had Maxine for eight years. So before that, I used a white cane. And a white cane doesn't need to be fed doesn't need to be watered. And when you're done with it, you can fold it up and put it away. It's a lot of responsibilities to have a guide dog. And I first applied for a guide dog when I was 15 years old. And after submitting my application to three different guide dog schools, I told my friend that I was applying for a guide dog. And he asked me, why are you applying for a guide dog? And I said, I'd feel more confident walking around and crossing streets if I have a guide dog. And he said, so you're going to rely on a dog for confidence? <laughs> and it was a good point. That did seem silly. So I canceled my applications and I worked on building up my own confidence. I need to get confidence from me. I shouldn't rely on other people or a dog for confidence. So I built up my travel skills, learned to travel independently with a cane. And several years later, I again decided I want a guide dog, that I wanted a guide dog. This time, not for confidence, but for additional information. She provides environmental information. When there are obstacles in our path, she moves around obstacles. When she hears loud noises or someone knocking on my door, she lets me know. She's also very sweet. A lot of people are afraid of disability, are afraid of difference. And they don't know how to approach me and say hi. But when they see a beautiful guide dog, they find something they can connect over. And she becomes a way through which people who are maybe a little shy about disability can come forward and connect. So she helps with environmental information. She helps in encouraging people to feel comfortable to come forward and approach us. She's very sweet. She received training for two years at the Seeing Eye, a guide dog school in Morristown, New Jersey. Then she joined me for my final year of college, three years at Harvard Law School, walked the stage with me. She's a very smart dog. <laughs> Thanks so much. You're welcome, Doug. Hi. 
Hi, Haven. I'm Deborah. Good to meet you, Deborah. You speak and dance beautifully. How do you learn to pronounce a word? You don't know already. So I have a little bit of hearing in the high frequencies. So I intuitively learned to speak in a higher voice so I could hear a little bit of what I say. And that helps a lot. There are all different kinds of hearing loss. Mine is very unusual. Most people have the opposite kind of hearing loss, but I have low frequency loss. So low frequency is very difficult for me to hear, pretty much impossible. High frequencies, I can hear a little bit. And with all disabilities, blindness, deafness, it's all on a spectrum. Most blind people can see a little bit. Most deaf people could hear a little bit. That said, pronouncing new words is still very difficult for me. I've been in New Orleans for about two days, and I still can't pronounce that donut they have here. Hi, Haven and Maxine. <laughs> Great to hear you today. And what's your name? My name is Gotham. Good to meet you. You're the most fun speaker by far. Oh, don't trust, don't tell Chris Hatfield. <laughs> I think he will agree. <laughs> I'm always amazed at how fast my friends with disabilities use the phone. They're faster than me. What's your pet peeve of the apps you use? So most apps are not accessible. A lot of app developers don't know about accessibility or, or their leaders don't prioritize accessibility. So most apps are not accessible. For the ones that are accessible, one problem that continues to exist is when they update the app, they sometimes forget to include accessibility. So they make an accessible app, then they update it, and the updates break accessibility. That's incredibly frustrating. So not only should we plan for accessibility, but also maintain accessibility as the app develops. Thank you. You're welcome. I want to add, don't worry about typos. Don't worry in spelling and grammar. The audience won't find out. <laughs> Hi, Haven. What's your name? I'm Raphael. Good to meet you. You too. This is the last question. Are you aware of services that help make websites and social media accessible. There are guidelines online to help web app developers, website developers make their services accessible. So it's about, it's about the code 
how you format the code, including headers, including captions for videos, including alternative tech descriptions, text descriptions for images. So all of that information helps make apps and websites accessible. So you can share these guidelines with your web team if they need extra help. There are accessibility companies that will partner and help make those services accessible. One is called Nobility, K-N-O-W-B-I-L-I-T-Y, based in Austin, Texas. They help companies make websites and apps accessible. There's several others around the country. Another one is Accessibility Partners, based in DC. So those are some companies that can offer extra help if a team wants extra help in making their services accessible. That was a great question. Thank you. Thank you so much. You are a true inspiration. I love teaching people about accessibility and encouraging everyone to make our communities more inclusive. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Haven, it's Jack. I'm running this conference, so I get to have the last question. <laughs> I have two questions. First, how can you read? How fast can you read? I can read quite fast. People should be encouraged to type as fast as they want. I've rarely encountered someone who can type faster than I can read. It's only happened twice, and I've just kindly asked them to slow down. <laughs> okay, second question. Is reading a question for someone that can't touch type frustrating because they're really, really slow? to ask questions. I am an inclusion advocate. <laughs> Part of my job is role modeling inclusion. So I need to accommodate someone if they're a slow typist. President Obama is a slow typist. <laughs> He was typing with two fingers. And it was worth it for me. I was happy to be patient and wait for him to communicate at his own pace. I will meet anyone and accommodate anyone however they need to be accommodated. I can't just ask for accommodations. I need to role model that too. So I'm happy to be patient with slow typists. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us. Can everyone please give me a huge, huge applause?